Aldo. Giuppo, pure Aldo. Ah. Allora, chi non deve parlare chiuda il microfono e, Frances e Roberta quando vuoi puoi parlare per introdurre, sì. Mi sentite intanto? Mi sentite? Mi vedete? Ditemi quando io parto. Perché non si sentiva bene? Adesso si sente? Io sento, la vediamo, la... Io sento bene. Allora, in chat, perfetto, in chat scrivono, la vediamo e la sentiamo perfettamente. Quindi ah, posso benissimo. cominciare con... Okay. Quindi Renata, inizio? Sì, vai, vai. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Let me to welcome the, all the participants of the conference Freedom, Political Liberalism and Free Trade in Russia, from history to the prospect of the Russian-European relation. My name is Roberta Lonzi. I am professor in history of international relations at the People's Friendship University of Russia. I am very delighted to moderate this panel in this session, we are going to speak about political and legal liberalism from empire to immigration. I would like to draw your attention to the main topics under consideration in your session. Uh, the is liberalism and constitutionalism in a multi-ethnic empire, Russia, 1906-1917 and freedom, role of law, and the, the radical nihilism in Russian Finnish imperi, and the Russian liberalism from immigration to Paris to the split, 1917-1921. Uh, uh, dear colleagues, we are ready to start. Let me present the first speaker, Giovanna Cigliano, uh, professor of contemporary history at the Federico II University, Naples. Uh, the topic of the presentation of Professor Cigliano, uh, liberalism and constitutionalism in a multi-ethnic empire, Russia, 1906-1917. Professor Cigliano, you have the floor now. Thank you, thank you. Good afternoon. Well, it's for me a source of satisfaction uh, to participate in this conference today. And I would like to, to, to thank the organizer who invited me. Well, Russian democratic liberalism at the beginning of the 20th century had an ambitious political project. The establishment of the rule of law and the constitutional democratic reform of the autocratic state. Russian liberals didn't doubt that the full implementation of Ravno Pravye and the institution of parliamentarism will transform the Tsar subjects in conscious citizens. They had an unshakable faith in the transforming educational power of the rule of law and of the representative democracy. <clears throat> uh, this paper is devoted to a specific aspect of the political culture of Russian liberalism. How did the Russian liberals address the questions connected with the multi-ethnic nature of the empire? How did they react to national movements arousing mostly in the borderlands of the empire? In discussing these topics, we can individuate three phases. First, the period of the first revolution of the birth of autocratic constitutionalism, 1904 to 1907. Two, uh, second, the years uh, 1907 to 1914. Third, the First World War and the Revolution, 1914 to 1916. First period. Since its first step in the framework of the Union of Liberation, Sayusa Svabashdienia, on the eve of the First Revolution, Russian constitutionalism had to face the challenge of national questions in the Western borderlands of the empire. That is, 
northwestern and southwestern regions corresponding to Baltic, Baltic countries, Be Belarus, Ukraine, and Finland and Poland incorporated in the empire respectively in uh, 1809 and 1815 with a, a special st status, the Grand Duchy of Finland and the reign of Poland, subsequently curtailed or abolished. The Union engaged in the, in the construction of the widest possible anti-autocratic front, had meetings and negotiations during 1904 with members of the national movements. First of all, Finns and Poles. The political confrontation between the Union and the Polish exponents became intense in the first month of 1905, and it certified the special place that the Polish question occupied in the agenda of the liberation movement and its role in urging the Russian Democrats not to confine themselves to the reform of the local self-government and to address the issue of autonomia too. The provincial organizational networks of the Union of Liberation were particularly sensitive to the issue. In the Third Congress of the Union, March 1905, the delegates of the southwestern regions failed to pass the idea of regional self-government as a general criterion for the reorganization of the state, but obtained the inclusion of Little Russia, that is Ukraine, next to Poland, Lithuania, and Transcaucasia among the regions deserving a very wide local self-government. This was the compromise solution adopted instead of the controversial word autonomy, autonomy, rejected by Pavel Milyukov in 1904. During the spring summer 1905, while revolution was mounting and after several meetings with Poles, the veto on autonomy was de facto, de facto removed. The last Congress of the Union of Liberation held in August approved a report on the question of nationality rights and of administrative and legislative decentralization, whose author was the jurist Fyodor Kakoshkin. The report had a first part on the rights of nationalities, Grazdanske Ravnopravie, cultural self-determination, and a second part devoted to administrative decentralization through local self-government and political decentralization through regional autonomy. The report was approved by a large majority in the second Congress of representatives of Ziemstwa and Town Dumas held in September 1905, after a heated debate during which a fracture emerged with the liberal right wing, led by Alexander Guchkov, who feared the disruptive consequences of autonomy Guchkov remained attested on the formulation of very wide local self-government and was against the prefiguration of faster times for Polish autonomy. Guchkov became soon the leader of the party of the moderate liberalism, the Octoberist party. The press campaign launched by the right-wing circles against the dismembers of the empire showed how the national issues were politically divisive. In October 1905, while the general strike paralyzed the country, forcing the Tsar to promulgate the October Manifesto, the first Congress of the Constitutional Democratic Party, Kadieti, was held in Moscow. This party was the main heir of the Union of Liberation and became the most important political organization of the liberal democratic area. Kakoshkin's report was the basis of the sections devoted to these themes in the program of the Cadet Party. Articles 11 and 12 of Section 1, Fundamental Rights of Citizens, and the whole Section 3, entitled Local Self-Government and Autonomy. In this section, Articles 25 and 26 were devoted respectively to Finland and Poland. The Article 24 provided, without referring to specific areas of the empire, for the opening of a gradu gradual process of establishing local autonomy. In this formulation, the will to not identify the great democratic theme of political decentralization with the national question clearly emerges. This attitude could certainly be traced back 
to a general approach which considered the solution of national questions subordinated to the liberal democratic transformation of the state. But it was also the product of the awareness of the problems that any national promotion policy or any attempt to draw national boundaries in multi-ethnic territories could trigger among the minority groups living on the same territory. During the years of the first Russian revolution, the concept of Ablasnaya Avtonomia, uh, regional autonomy, in its relationship with the local self-government and federalism, became the subject of intense debate between the Russian Democrats and the Ukrainian national movement, inspired by the principle of federalism. Ukrainians tended to interpret the regional autonomy as national autonomy. The Ukrainian historian Mikhail Okrushevsky was promoting the concept of national territorial autonomy. So in general, we can say that the confrontation with the Polish and Ukrainian national movements was of primary importance for the elaboration of the cadet party's program concerning nationality rights and decentralization. Kakoshkin, already in the report presented in September, had precised that it was only in the Polish case that there was the coincidence between regional and national. He reiterated this position in a brochure entitled Ablasnaya Avtonomia Yedinstvo Rasi, whose intent was twofold, counteract concerns about imperial disintegration, by illustrating the legal meaning of autonomy and its clear difference from federalism and clarify to the national movements, especially the Ukrainian one, eager to be quoted with Poles, that autonomy had to be understood in a territorial sense. The same concept was reaffirmed in the brochure written by another well-known cadet jurist, Vladimir Yesen, in January 1906. Yesen wrote his brochure in preparation of the electoral campaign for the first state Duma. His intent was to promote the electoral alliance among center-left forces, that is, Kadet Party, plus the progressive national movements in the Akraini of the empire. These local coalitions helped the Kadets to get the better of the Octobrist-led coalition and made possible the election to the first Duma of a consistent group of rep representatives of the nationalities. In the first state Duma, when the Russian shine constitutionalism, uh, you know, the term is, uh, is of Ma Max Weber, um, who he used this uh, to describe the situation in Russia at that moment. Firstly, when the Russian shine constitutionalism was firstly emerged, there were delegates in the first Duma from 24 different peoples. The overall percentage of non-Russian deputies was over 40%, and the Soyuz Avtanamistov coagulated. The Kadet party gained the relative majority of seats and was the winner of the elections. The political priority of building a solid majority in the assembly through the alliance with the Trudoviki pushed the agrarian question to the fore over national issues, despite the fact that some exponents of the Polish and Ukrainian national movements were at the same time also members of the Kadet party, Lednitsky, Shraz, Lavinsky, and that the party incorporated a left fringe, Abninsky, for example, favorable to autonomy in a long-term federal perspective. The adoption by the party leadership of a delaying policy on national issues was also the consequence of the awareness of the fractures that national teams could produce. Above all, in the cadet program, regional autonomy could be implemented only after the establishment of democracy at the central level. The institutional and political context defined by the December electoral law and the new fundamental laws of April uh, 23, 1906, was far from providing a universal suffrage and parliamentarism. Second period, after the defeat of the revolution and the passing of a new electoral law, June uh, 3, 1907, which heavily curtailed the representation of non-Russian nationalities, 
There was little political space to address national autonomous issues in the Third Duma, dominated by the center-right forces. During these years, liberal imperialism was consolidating among members of the right wing of the cadet party and among members of the centrist area between cadets and octobrists, as the Trubetsky brothers. For some of them, for example, the leader of the small party of the peaceful regeneration, Prince Yevgeny Trubetskoy, the Polish question was the only national question truly worth, worthy of attention. The liberal fringe in the Neo-Slav movement attached the crucial importance to the improvement of the Polish-Russian relations, both for domestic and international reasons, but the force in this direction were frustrated by the prevalence of the forces inspired by the mounting Russian nationalism in the pan-Slav movement. Besides, initiatives of the Stalipin government inspired by Russian nationalism, such as the separation of a column from the Polish provinces and the introduction of the Zemstva in the Western regions of the empire, significantly contributed to hindering the already difficult Russian-Polish dialogue. After the Bosnian crisis of 1908, Russian liberalism had to deal with the growing influence of Russian nationalism in domestic politics and the intensification of inter-imperial competition on the international scene. Among cadets, different political orientations regarding these issues were emerging. Liberals on the right, to quote, the famous book of Richard Pipes, as Piotr Struve, inspired by a strong feeling of patriotic, patriotic anguish, patrioticeskaya trivoga, began to claim the Russians' right to affirm their national nalitso, national face, and to represent the Tsarist state as an empire with a strong national nucleus constituted by the Russian nation involved in a process of self-construction, a nation in the making. This idea of a national empire centered on Russians was opposed to the concept of the empire of the peoples developed by another cadet, the Ukrainian Maxim Slavinsky. Since 1906, Slavinsky promoted the idea of Imperia Narodov, Centralism will have to be replaced by regional and national autonomies. The Russian autocratic empire will have to become a constitutional empire of peoples. The visions of empire of Struve and Slavinsky were not compatible, and the constitutional democratic leadership had to navigate in the middle between Silla of the empires of people and Charybdis of national empire. This pluralism on national issues characterized the cadets not only with respect to the Octobrist, but also to the centrist liberal galaxy. In the difficult years of the Third Duma, Slavinsky emphasized this fact, this fact to explain why cadets remains the privileged interlocutor of the Ukrainian national movement. After Stalin's departure and on the eve of the electoral campaign for the Fourth Duma, the activism of the national movements in the borderlands again intensified. At the end of 1911, the Cadet Central Committee had defined the party line, confirmed by the electoral program approved in May, uh, in May uh, 1912, to conduct an intransigent battle against the nationalist right and to support the right to cultural self-determination of nationalities. Um, right to use language in the schools, in administration, in courts, etc. At the same time, Milukov warned his party colleagues against raising the issue of autonomy. A new factor to be taken also into account was the fact that in 1912, the socialist parties had updated their programs to make room for national issues. Moreover, some leftist members of the cadet party, starting from uh, 1912 began to put again the theme of autonomy and also federalism on the political agenda of the democratic intelligentsia. Aftanamisti, federalisti reorganized them themselves. In October 1913, a cadet working commission was set up on the national question. 
And in the plenary session of the Cadet Central Committee on March of the same, uh, um, 1914, Milukov expressly invited his colleagues on the left to refrain from participating in the Congress of Autonomous Federalists. At the same time, he traveled to Kiev to confront the Ukrainian claims. And this political confrontation culminated in the meeting with the Ukrainians that took place on March 24, during the general conference of the party. Once again, the problem of the interpretation of Article 24 of the party's program, regional autonomy in a territorial or national sense, returned to the forefront. The direct confrontation had made the differences between Milukov's and Khrushchev's approaches even more clear. At the same time, it's noteworthy the effort to reach a compromise that would make political collaboration possible, at least on the battlefield for cultural self-determination. Third period. With the First World War, the multi-ethnic Tsarist Empire was called upon to face the difficult challenge of total mobilization. The initial broad support to patriotic unity by national parties and groups and the positive reception given to the appeals addressed to the Russian populations by the commander-in-chief Grand Duke Nikolai Nikolaevich, first of all to the Polish people, aroused great hopes among Russian rebels. They considered the war as a precious opportunity to build through shared patriotism, overcoming ethno-linguistic and regional fractures, an imperial citizenship that would become a prelude to a liberal democratic social and institutional renewal. A decisive role was attributed by some influential circles of Russian centrist liberalism to the solution of the Polish question in the spirit of the Pan-Slav Brotherhood as opposed to Pan-Germanism. But in the course of 1915, 1916 to 1916, this horizon has rapidly faded. The short season of Vnutri Nimir was running out, but patriotic unity had dissolved following. First, the oppressive treatment imposed by the Tsarist military uh, and civil bureaucracy on non-Russian nationalities, especially in the rare areas. Second, the nationalist Russification policies implemented in the occupied territories of Eastern Galicia. Third, the dynamics triggered by the great retreat on the Western borderlands. Four, the political choices made by the autocrat in the late summer of 1915, when the progressive bloc coagulated in the Duma. Due to the dramatic life experience of the populations in the Western areas, the agenda of the Sixth Cadet Party Congress, finally convened after eight years in February 1916, was significantly dictated by the preparatory work of its provincial and regional committees as the, the Kiev Regional Committees. The debate was characterized, therefore, by the cognition of the relevance of national and in particular Ukrainian issues towards the rear of the front. But nothing more that, than the general reference to the defense of the legal equality of nationalities was incorporated into the final resolution voted by the Congress. The coexistence in the progressive bloc of Milukov and Savenka, chairman of the Kiev Club of Russian Nationalists, seemed to undermine the possibility that the cadet party could make the political shift Ukrainians wanted to <coughs> see, especially when the feeling of Russian national pride was mounting among national liberals at a crucial moment of the war, the Brusilov Offensive in the summer 1916. Moreover, the de facto internationalization of the Polish question following the German occupation in the summer 1915 has decisively reduced the role of Russia in the solution of the Polish question. Significant stages of this path after occupation were the failure of Foreign Minister Sadzonov repeated attempts to persuade the Tsar and the government to recognize Poland's autonomy. 
and the declarations of the central empires in favor of the recognition of Polish independence in November 1916. After the overthrow of the Tsarism in February 1916, when the democratic forces finally came to power, Russian liberalism was called upon to give Im immediate political responses to the national demands in the peripheries of the empire. In March, the provisional government promulgated a general law which cancelled all national and religious discriminations, so establishing full Grozdanske Radnopravie. One of the first acts of the new democratic government was the manifesto which abolished all the curtailments to the old Finnish constitution implemented since the last decade of the 19th century. However, this timely political initiative was in the new revolutionary context, not enough to satisfy the demands of the Finnish national movement. It was also decided on the initiative of the foreign minister Milukov to intervene on the Polish question by promulgating a manifesto which supported the reunification of ethnographic Poland and its full independence. Autonomous claims immediately began to come from other nationalities, Ukrainians and also Lithuanians. The Kadak party urged since the 7th Congress of March to review its program in a federalist sense, held <clears throat> the late the 8th Congress of the party less than two months later in May. Here, after heated discussion around the Kakoshkin's report entitled Autonomia in Federatia, the party reaffirmed its opposition to the concept of national territorial autonomy and to the federalist option, supporting instead the idea of administrative and legislative decentralization to be implemented only after the convocation of the Constituent Assembly. Meanwhile, the Ukrainian Central Rada formed in Kiev a few days after the February Revolution quickly expanded its political influence, then went on to affirm its right to establish a very wide national territorial autonomy, proclaiming its legislative prerogatives, the formation of, of an executive body, the General Secretariat, and defining the boundaries of a new national territorial entity, Ukraine, on which this body is claimed operating power. The fact that this national entity incorporated the percentage of non-Ukrainian population, Jews, Russians, Poles, made the Rada's policy particularly difficult for cadets to underwrite. In a revolutionary context characterized by rapid political radicalization and by the explosion of the so-called Managavlastie, that is the proliferation of competing power centers at all levels, the scenarios so feared by the constitutional democrat democrats were becoming reality. The formation of autonomy bodies on a national basis in the multi-ethnic Western borderlands was taking place before the full democratic transformation of the central institutions. The exhortation to await the convocation of the Constituent Assembly before adopting any decision concerning the reform of the center periphery relations was interpreted as a delaying policy. All the difficulties and contradictions within the cadet party about these issues came to a head, helping to <clears throat> exacerbate the political difficulties of the provisional government and to fuel the satisfaction of the non-Russian nationalities. When the Bolsheviks <laughs> took the power, their quick recognition of the principle of national self-determination with the right of secession deprived the liberal democratic forces of any residual political space on this ground. In conclusion, we can subscribe to the reflection uh, oh, oh, I, I, I hear some rumors. In, a, in conclusion, we can subscribe to the reflections developed by historians, well-known historians as Shelakhayev, Valentin Shelakhayev, Dmitry Medushevsky, Theodor Weeks. 
Russian liberalism and democratic constitutionalism had a political culture which considered the solution of national questions subordinated to the universalistic establishment of the rule of law and representative democracy. In the cadet program, regional autonomy and political decentralization in general could be implemented only after the election of a representative assembly with the universal suffrage, that is after the establishment of democracy at the central level. The aforementioned historians argued that Kakoshkin's regional autonomy was conceived as a means of integrating national cultures within a single civil society and not as the promotion of national claims toward the state center. In short, it was an approach that in confronting with national problems was still rooted in 19th century democratic perspective of progressive assimilation of differences an example of this kind of attitude is the concept of national minimal sides, minimal sides of nations that inspired Mazzini, for example. This political culture, they concluded, uh, these historians, had not become, the political culture of Russian liberalism, they said, had not become fully aware of the multinational character of the empire and was therefore distant from the recognition of the principle of national self-determination that inspired both Wilsonism and Leninism. To this irrefutable general assessment, I would add only a few considerations which arise from the reconstruction of a story which, as we have seen, <laughs> is uh, complex and, and, and rich. First, regarding the rights of nationalities, they were, as we said, to a large extent, considered inherent to the full Grashdanske Ravno Pravie. But it's also true that cadet leadership was, since the beginning, well conscious that Ravno Pravie wasn't exhaustive. The self-determination in cultural matters was also necessary, and this did not really go in the direction of assimilation. The epilog of October 1917 must not make us forget the rich pluralism which characterized the, since 1904 the debates on national issues among exponents of the Russian constitutionalism. It was mostly national liberalism a la Struve that was consciously promoter of a project of democratic assimilation of national differences. Third, Regarding the lack of awareness about the multinational character of the empire, I think that this is a partially inaccurate statement. After all, one of the main concerns of the party leadership gathered around Milukov was the protection of the rights of national minorities distributed throughout the imperial territory. They tried unsuccessfully to find the path placed between the federalist horizon of the empire of peoples and the assimilating perspective of the Struvian national imperial state. It was an impervious road that would have needed a well-established gradualist political horizon and the definitive setting aside of the Russifying policies. But it was precisely this horizon that was missing in late imperial Russia of Nicholas II and the First World War marked its definitive burial. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Cigliano, for your paper. Uh, as you pointed out, uh, from the beginning, Russian liberalism had to, had to face the challenge of the national questions, namely, um, nationality rights and the administrative and political decentralization. Um, Russian li liberalism had to deal with the growing influence of Russian nationalism in domestic politics and um, the intensification of inter-imperial competition on the international scene. Uh, and after the revolutions of 1970, Russian liberalism was called upon um, to give uh, immediate political responses to the national demands in the periphery uh, of the empire. In particular, 
there was a streaking, uh, there was a streaking contrast uh, between the concept of um, a national empire and the concept of the empire of the peoples. Yes. Thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. And now let me introduce our second speaker, Gian Maria Ayani, professor of constitutional law at the University of Turin. Uh, the um, topic of the presentation of Professor Ayani, uh, freedom, role of law and the juridical nihilism in Russian Finnish Imperi. Uh, Professor Ayani, please, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much also for inviting me to this uh, uh, fascinating conference and my best uh, congratulations to the organizer, Dr. Gravina, who was able not only to gather all of us in spite of the distance, but also to, to design a very coherent and compact uh, um, set of papers. In fact, uh, listening to the last presentation, I feel that my presentation is just uh, in the further chapter in the, in the discourse on uh, liberalism rule of law in the uh, imperial Russia. Um, just a slight correction, I'm not professor of constitutional law, I am a comparativist. My field is mainly private and international law, so it's uh, um, far from being an expert on constitutions. Um, I have been, uh, in fact, trained as a Sovietologist and I've been working on Soviet and Russian law for 20 years, uh, which somehow blurs the distinction between private and public or constitutional law because under Sovietism, in fact, everything was public. So private law, in fact, was a weak sector. But we are not talking about Soviet law today. We are talking about uh, pre-Soviet uh, um, legal uh, tradition and cultures. Um, my paper is belongs to a research I've been conducting for uh, many years on the, on the wider topic of the role of vague notions like uh, rule of law, like uh, good faith, like fairness, like governance in the um, practice of uh, legal reforms, uh, something which occurs quite um, uh, intensively in, in the years, in our current contemporary years of globalization, but something which also occurred at the turn between the 19th and 20th century. Um, Rule of law, in fact, is somehow the queen, or if you prefer the king, vague clause, because it has been used in different, very different contexts to signal and to support a wider um, project of legal reforms. That is true for Russia at the turn of the century. It is again, and that is interesting, true for Russia, the post-Soviet Russia, where in fact uh, drafting the constitution um, in the 90s, early 90s, uh, Russian uh, professors decided to include the pravavoy gasudastva, uh, the rule of law concept within the constitution as a standard. But what is interesting, and my presentation is just about that, is to measure how the real contents of the vague principle of rule of law changed from the um, last part of 19th century to the last part of the 20th century. So if you take a kind of calendar for a century, the rule of law, the pravavoy gasudasso uh, at the turn of the 19th into the 20th century was mainly based on the German idea of Reichstag, while the rule of law pravavoy gasudasso idea, which was included in the constitution of, Federal, of the Russian Federation in 1993, is mainly based on the British American principle of rule of law. We normally, we jurists as well as political scientists, we normally uh, translate um, without paying the needed attention to words, uh, rule of law with the Reichstag. But if we pay a bit more attention, we will find that Reichstag, like Pravavoy Gasudarso, like Stato di diritto in Italian or Etat de droit in French do not translate rule of law. Uh, there is not 
mention of the term state in the rule of law, there is a law and there is rule. In the continental European tradition, including the Russian one, uh, we have state, which does not um, belong to the Anglo-American experience. And that is particularly relevant. It's not just a subtle um, note on a terminology. We do use state because the, the Reichstadt idea was the evolution of the Polizeistadt idea, which was a translation in German of the Etat bien policé, where Polizei does not mean police, but it means policy. The Etat bien policé French was the absolutist kingdom of the French kings, where law played the role of um, administering the absolute state, providing some uh, set of mm, rules, uh, predictable rules. So the Etat bien policé, the Polizeistaat, was uh, the state where law played a secondary role in terms of providing a good management of the society. The Reichstadt was an important transformation of the Polizeistaat because the Reichstadt idea, which was developed by the German scholars at the turn of the 19th century, um, the Pandectist, they um, defined the Reichstadt as the situation where citizens were holding public uh, rights, efficiently rights, public rights, meaning the, the fact of having a bench of rights to protect and defend your personal interest against abuses and um, um, and wrongs by the public administration. So if the, if the state is violating my rights, I can bring the state before the judge and asking for redress. That is the root of the Reichstag, um, which was in fact um, deployed under the German uh, legal scholarship and had a strong, very strong influence um, as everything which uh, came from Germany into the Russian intelligentsia by the end of 19th century. In fact, by that time, German law was the main model for the Russian reformers, for the Chinese reformers, for the Japanese reformers, for reformers in Italy and in other countries. So um, German law, Reichstag, was the model, the pattern for the Pravavoy Gasudasu. Now, coming to the more specifically to the topic of my presentation, which is about the fate of liberalism, um, as you can imagine, rule of law and I will be using now indifferently rule of law and pravavoy gasudasso. With that note, pravavoy gasudasso is in that period of time does not translate rule of law. If you like, it translates Reichstag. Um, so the point was the following: rule of law, pravavoy gasudasso, was um, a play, a card to be played by liberals uh, in the in the decades between seventies um, and the end of the nineteenth century. Um, and in fact, it left a trace in the project of the new um, constitution, in fact, the first constitution of 1906, the unfortunate constitution, which was in fact given by the Tsar and then uh, withdraw after a while. Um, reasons for that. One reason is the following, and I will be trying to, to, to give you some arguments about some reasons about that. By the time the constitutional reform was um, pushed by the 1905 revolution, uh, was adopted by the Tsar in 1906, the, the real pure nature of liberal legal thinking had um, faded away. And we have the trace of that in the literature of the period where in fact discussions on the rule of law have left the, the, the place to other concepts like socialisticeskoe pravavoy gasudarstvo or like spravedlivo gasudarstvo, fair, just state. Uh, there is, in other words, and the moment when the reform is adopted, um, a notion which used to be strong when used by the liberals like Chicherin in their books and articles, which had become more and more weak, was weakened by the emergence of the socialist legal thinking, which was mainly produced in the, in the period 
in the French legal literature. So there was a shift in watching new ideas from the German legal thinking, classically purely liberal, Reichstag based, towards the French um, jurisprudence sociologique, the sociological jurisprudence of the end of 19th century, where in fact, uh, freedoms and rights of citizens had to come to terms with social uh, issues. So the ones who um, supported the final drafting of the uh, 1906 constitution were, and I will be mentioning the names later on, we were more inspired by the, by the French-based attention on, the, um, on, on balancing private rights of individuals with the social rights, right to labor, right to education, um, right to life. Um, let me pause for a moment and uh, trying to offer you a, a connected argument, which is the following. There had been a debate for decades about why Soviet law was so much um, unexistent or, or fake, if you like, or too much formal uh, to be considered as true. Uh, that debate, uh, which was particularly mm, um, exaggerated in the 50s and the 60s and was led by American Sovietologists, was based on an idea which is the following. Uh, Soviet law inherited a very weak legal tradition from the empire. There, the, Russia had no time for developing um, a, a liberal, pure, free um, set of concepts um, which found the, 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 the soil for Western uh, legal traditions. Uh, on the contrary, the fact that the, the, the shift was from an absolute empire with a very short period of the, of the, of the liberal uh, state into the Soviet totalitarianism uh, was also due to the fact that there was not a, a developed legal discourse on rights. Uh, that has been um, enriched recently because in fact, even the post-Soviet experience of the last uh, 25 years shows that in spite of a huge apparatus of, of rules, norms, codes, the constitution, uh, judges, the constitutional court, um, Russian contemporary law is very far from being um, respectful of the main uh, rule of law um, ideas in terms of protection of uh, individuals from the whim of, of, the, of the political um, administration and, and the power. So in other words, uh, it seems that during the, the, the imperial and then the Soviet and then the post-Soviet uh, eras uh, covering 150 years about, um, law in Russia never had the opportunity to be separated from morals and politics, which is the important shift which on, um, conversely had occurred in the Western legal tradition, where in fact, since the French Revolution, we started, we as continentals, to divide quite clearly uh, law from morals and law from politics. So the, the structure of the separation of powers uh, either in the French or in the American um, schemes, which are different, are there to expressly separate politics from law. It seems that something like that never occurred in Russia. And one reason, in my opinion, is that um, liberalism uh, had not the chance to, um, to, 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 to fertilize uh, the legal thinking um, in, in Russia. Um, as I mentioned, the, the core debate, the, the, the focus of the debate occurred in the years between the, the very end of 19th century and the adoption of the 06 constitution. Um, and in fact, um, when we look at the, at the, at the literature at the time, uh, we see that um, what Chicherin wrote about, uh, um, about the rule of law was uh, in fact published quite uh, quite earlier than the years of the of the contingent debate of, of the on the impact of the of the constitution uh, of the 06 constitution. Um, so um, 
if we the concept I, I to summarize in, in in a couple of words is the following the reforms the partial reforms of 1905-1906 uh, were um, weakened by a delayed reception so everything occurred too late uh, is not only the the fear of the of the of the emperor and his uh, circle uh, against the new ideas brought by the uh, by the reforms uh, it was the fact that uh, everything occurred um, too uh, late and too late in the sense that um, liberalism and the rule of law by the adoption of the 1906 constitution were compressed between pragmatism what to do with the constitution how to adopt it without uh, exaggeration uh, pragmatism and nihilism and the nihilism in fact was reinforced as we know by the um by the bad fate of the constitution by the fact that um, after having a, um, adopted the constitution there was a step back uh, which in fact made um some circles in the in the intelligentsia um not only within the 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 sr the socialist party very much cynical about <clears throat> the relevance of the law in order to really transform uh, the the russian the russian state um who are the who are the scholars who uh, made uh, that um, transformation from liberalism into a kind of um, conditional recognition of the Pravavoye Gasudasso. Uh, well, very well known names like Petrozhitsky, uh, like uh, Solovyov, uh, like Kistiakovsky. Um, all these uh, scholars and writers made Boris Chicherin a kind of isolated figure. Um, he was considered to be somehow eccentrical within the landscape of the um, of the legal and political literature of the end of the 19th century. Um, less isolated than Chicherin were, by sure, Solovyov, as well as Petrosichsky, uh, who were active um, at, at least until until the, the, the start of the of the of the Bolshevik um, revolution. Um, Solovyov was important in the transformation of the rule of law idea because uh, he wanted to find a compromise a synthesis between um, traditionally positions within the intelligentsia itself and the and the ideas for reforms uh, Solovyov wanted and wrote about um, ex experimenting a compatibility between the conception of the state as elaborated by the great German model from one side and the Christian idea of justice. But in doing so, and I know that I'm very much um, summarizing his very complex and interesting uh, thought by Solovyov, in doing so, he, he joined the Russian mainstream school, which wanted a moral foundation for the law. Again, um, Chicherin remains isolated because he wanted to, um, to grasp the train of the complete separation between morals, ethics, religion from one side and law from the other side, because that was the progress, that was modernity uh, in his view. Uh, Solovyov was very much more popular uh, in the sense that he recognized that this, the peculiarity of the Russian situation needed a connection between um, between the Christian idea of justice um, with some elements of populism and the uh, and the uh, and the legal reforms based on the rule of law. Uh, interesting also is the position of Kistiakovsky, who had sorry of Petrozhitsky, uh, who was uh, very active as a scholar um he had an if i'm not wrong a polish uh, origin but he was a um, citizen of the russian empire petrozhitsky um wanted also to adopt the rule of law idea which means separation of powers um a cabinet uh, elected by a parliament 
but at the same time, um, he wanted to ground that on the specific Russian conditions. Uh, he was closer to the left um, elements of the intelligentsia because Petrozhitsky uh, wanted to elaborate um, a new foundation for the validation of the law. He, he wrote, uh, we cannot be nihilistic about the law because the only way to, 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 to coexist for a complex society is to make use of cold legal rules, rules detached from the passion of blood and violence. Uh, so back to Hobbes in a way, um, but he wanted to apply a new legal framework for Russia into a strong um, grounded legitimacy, which had to be Russian and was not based on, on religion and Christianism as for Solovyov, for him was based on legal scholarship. So he wanted to base um, the new framework for a new institutional Russia into the study and the research of legal scholarship, which reminds us of a great German scholar who was uh, von Savigny, um, quite a century before, he, Savigny was active in the first quarter of the 19th century in Germany, who wanted to create the ground and the basis for a one nation German state. By the time Savigny wrote, Germany was divided in 49 states, uh, based on a legal um, comprehension and a legal base on the constitution designed by legal scholars. The idea that experts, um, particularly lawyers, uh, had the scope to reform the country was particularly new in a sense um, in, um, in Russia. Needless to say, uh, Petrozhitsky was banned as a, as a bourgeois um, who um, deserved no attention uh, when Kaganovich uh, wrote in 1930, in the mid of the of the Stalinist um, period of power, Kaganovich wrote, um, "If anyone talks seriously about pravavoy gasudastvo, or worse, applies the notion of pravavoy gasudastvo to the Soviet state, it means that he deviates from Marxist-Leninist teaching on the state." And um, Pashukanis. Uh, if a relevant, important, uh, great figure in the legal thinking of Soviet, um, of the first Soviet period until he was, um, it was uh, killed by the Stalinist terror for his ideas. Um, Pashukanis uh, was supporting Kaganovich, saying that the law based state, the Pravabor Gasudaswa, is a mirage, is a mirage only useful for the bourgeoisie because it substitutes religious ideology with the law. The Pravavoy Gasudasva conceals to the masses the reality of the bourgeois rule. So the idea that you could design the basis for a new government of Russia, a new governance for Russia on the work of um, jurists looking at models, particularly the German model, uh, was completely quashed by, by, by the Soviets. The last one I, I would like to, to mention is Kistiakovsky. Um, Kistiakovsky, another um, uh, relevant uh, figure in the, in, the, um, in the Russian legal intelligentsia, also was looking um, at, the, um, at the foreign model, but foreign models, but he was more influenced by French, um, the French um, debate on the role of law in the society. Uh, in 1906, in the same year of the adoption of the constitution, Kistiakovsky wrote, um, history demonstrates that the law governed state has been achieved imperfectly by bourgeois parliamentary democracies, while the future opens the way to a new model, the socialist rule of law, the socialist teaches pravavoy gasudastro. He's the first one in my understanding who used that. Um, but in using an adjective, socialist he was weakening the idea 
of Pravavoya Gasudarsu. He was, as others, um, denying a cool split between law and politics. The Pravavoya Gasudarsu was um, conceivable in Russia only as long as it was um, accompanied, supported by an adjective which is socialist teachers. As I mentioned right now, Kaganovich and Pashukanis in the 30s were strongly against the idea of using the Reichstag Pravaboy Gasudasso um, model as something useful for the Soviet law. Uh, Stalin wanted his constitution in 1936, which was the rebirth of law as an instrument of uh, power and defense for the Soviet strong state. Stalin, in effect, wanted to reestablish the rule of law, but in terms of the power and the supremacy of the party over the law, which is exactly the denial of what the rule of law is, because the rule of law is about protecting citizens from the uh, um, arbitrariness of the party. So no rule of law at all. On the contrary, it was very dangerous to mention even the name uh, during the Soviet times, but as well um, as for other um, models, um, the idea did not uh, did not um, um, die, and it, it was resumed. And we find again during the perestroika um, um, lawyers renewing uh, the socialist teachers called Pravavoya Gasudarsu idea, um, supported by Kistiakovsky. So quite a good and large literature in this in the 85, 86, the Gorbachev's year, the years of perestroika until 89, about um, reconsidering Pravavoya Gasudarsu as a model, separation of power. Um, but at this time, uh, we are approaching the end of the 20th century. At that time, the model was not anymore German um, Reichstag. On the contrary, it was the Anglo-American rule of law. And in fact, um, the same as for the civil code, the Grosjdansko Eulogenie project, which was adopted in 1905, but never published. And then it was used for the post-Soviet codification in 95. The socialist teachers code was used um, during the perestroika and was even more used when uh, Russia um, entered the complete the, the post-Soviet phases. Uh, and in 1993, the new constitution, which is still um, in force today, adopted uh, the Pravavoya as um, a standard. So Russia today is a rule of law based state. Uh, we can disagree with that, but uh, it is written in the Constitution. Um, it is also written in the Constitution because in order to be admitted into the Council of Europe, which is um, nothing to do with the European Union, the Council of Europe is an institution based in Strasbourg. Uh, the aim of the Council of Europe is to protect fundamental rights of citizens, specifically in cases when these rights are violated by the, by the governments. And in order to enter the Council of Europe, Russia had to include the Pravavoy Gasudasu idea into the constitution. Whether that is applied or not is another affair. Um, but um, with that, I'm concluding. And um, I, th I think I remained within the time I was um, allocated. Um, just saying that, um, uh, working on the history of ideas uh, is particularly interesting because it shows to us that in spite of big declarations by political powers, such as the rule of law is dead, or um, we do not do this, or we do not um, enforce foreign models, there is a kind of, um, of underground um, stream which remains. And in, uh, when history demands um, reopens uh, the doors, um, so work today, uh, if we want to leave the history and enter the contemporariness, uh, is about understanding what is the rule of law in, the, in contemporary Russia today, how that is used by uh, opponents to the a new autocracy to, uh, to, to provide a kind of protection to citizens' rights. 
thank you so much for your attention and I give you back the floor. Thank you very much for presentation. Thank you very much, Professor Ayani. Thank you very much for paper focusing the development uh, in imperial Russia of the scholarly and political debate on the concept of Pravovoy uh, Gosudarstva, arguing the impossibility of setting, of setting the doctrinal concept of Pravovoy Gosudarstva into action because of the failure of the um, 19, uh, 1906 constitution in Russia. Thank you very much. And uh, now I'm going to give the floor to our third speaker, uh, Renata Gravina, doctor in history of Europe, uh, Sapienza University of Rome. Uh, the focus, the topic of the presentation of Renata Gravina, um, Russian liberalism from, from emigration to Paris to the split 1970, uh, 1921. Renata, Dr. Gravina, please. Okay, do you hear me? Okay. Yes. My speech will complete in a way the, the two previous speech because I would um, deal with uh, Russian liberalism, but in particular with uh, uh, the last phase of Russian liberalism, which was the uh, split in uh, Russian uh, French um, immigration. Indeed, to uh, contextualize the background, I should say that, of course, uh, within France and Russia, there was the Franco-Russian alliance, which, as Karel Dankos, French scholar, was the acme between 1891 and, eight, and 1970, the acme of the French-Russian uh, relations. So this was very important because um, the uh, background was the main reason why the, uh, some Russian liberals decided to emigrate in uh, France and in Paris in, in particular. Uh, so the uh, alliance was, of course, a military alliance, but it was made up of many features. Uh, some other important features were the institutional one and the cultural one. As for the uh, economic feature, of course, uh, France was the main, became the main creditor of the Russian debt, whereas uh, Russia uh, was the banner against the, the German Empire. Uh, but there were many other relations which, which were also uh, specific peculiar relations. Some of them were, were made of uh, masonry, as uh, Professor Cigliano uh, wrote about, because there was um, a universal alliance between uh, French liberals and Russian liberals. And this, is, uh, this was particularly important for the emigration, for the political emigration. So um, another uh, important aspect was the uh, cultural aspect because uh, at first uh, liberation as Vapajdenie, the main uh, liberal review was published in Stuttgart and then in Paris. So Paris was also one of the mean for, for, for having uh, the possibility to, to, to speak, to express for Russian liberals. Then there was also an important uh, symbol. Uh, French was, of course, the icon of the French Revolution, even though the icon was quite difficult because there was uh, on one side the, the declaration of the right of man and citizen, but on the other side there was the danger of Jacobinism. However, it was a good banner also used for propaganda in 1905 and then in 1917, Russian liberals used the main principles of the French Revolution to, um, to promote 
rebel against authoritarianism. Moreover, the alliance itself was a way to boost institutional institutionalism in, in France because, for example, because of the loans, uh, the Tsar made a UCAS, so uh, um, a clause for being reliable to to, to refund the loan itself. So it was also an institutional boost for Russia uh, to, to, to have a, at least a, a first framework of institutional um, for, for reliability. Um, as for um, the um, 1917 year, uh, of course, the uh, Franco-Russian relationship was um, became quite critical because uh, French uh, were uh, afraid of, uh, uh, first of all, of the idea that Russia couldn't afford the uh, the, the loans. But then, of course, uh, as soon as the uh, war was uh, was began, also began, they, they were afraid of uh, a retirement from, from the war, and this, this was the case. So from, from March 1918, of course, from the breastplate of peace, the suspicion became a reality. Uh, but in a way, the uh, relationship between French and uh, uh, Russians continued, um, particularly within single personalities. Uh, I saw um, many uh, documents within French archives. Um, Stéphane Pichon and Joseph Moulin, for example, were the foreign minister, the French foreign minister and the um, French ambassador in, 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 uh, in Russia. They were some of those people who continued a great and important relationship with uh, liber Russian liberals, even though officially Georges Clemenceau considered Russia as traitor of the common cause, especially the defensive one. So um, what is, I think, important to say for, for, for the special path of Russia Russian liberal immigration in Paris was that it was like a special path because of the icon, because of a, a special single relationship and moreover uh, for, for international law, because in Paris in 1919, it was established the Parisian Peace Conference, which was um, a kind of chance for Russian liberals to fight Bolshevism from outside. So as soon as Bolsheviks already uh, um, won. The, 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 there was also, uh, there had been also the, the rise of Bolsheviks in, in, in main cities. They decided to fight it at first within the counter revolution, but then within the international framework. And I think that it started a complete new phase, which was a, a really international phase, which was made uh, of different components. The first was uh, an attempt to have uh, a help from the alliance, uh, so French and Britain. But of course, the, the Franco-Russian alliance was more peculiar than the British one because of the reason I, I, I already spoke of. Um, so uh, within the um, Parisian conference, there was um, an, um, an attempt of political organism, which was the political Russian political conference, Ruskaya Politicheskaya Savesheni, which was a kind of um, um, shadow government established from the um, Paris, from the uh, Russian Parisian embassy. So it, it was a, a kind of political, national, and international attempt to uh, to overthrow the Bolshevik idea, which was of course winning from outside. Um, of course, this idea um, failed. It was um, an attempt um, after the, the, the timeline, we would say, but it was very interesting 
precisely because of the national question that was uh, treated by Professor uh, Cigliano, because one of the main um, goals, one of the main achievement for, for Russian liberals in Paris were to maintain Russian sovereignty. So they did a, a great number of memorandum for each nationality, which was in which was uh, um, uh, discussed during the, the Wilsonism idea of self-determination of nationalities, and they tried to perceive the self-determination of nation from the Russian perspective. So they, they would try to convince allies that even Russians should have their self-determination so that uh, Russians should have the possibility to be governed with the consent of the, of the government. So the idea of Wilson would have, uh, they thought it, it would have to be um, achieved also in, in Russia. Uh, of course, the, uh, the ally uh, didn't, uh, um, uh, didn't accept this idea, as is commonly known. But, uh, however, the attempt was very, very important for, uh, for as a political attempt, as an international attempt, and moreover as uh, a humanitarian attempt, because in parallel with uh, uh, this uh, political attempt, uh, in particular, uh, Vasily Maklakov, who was uh, one of the main uh, um, uh, one of the representative of a conservative, the conservative wing of liberals, uh, established in Paris uh, a mutual ad, so a Zaipomosh, a kind of, uh, as for, uh, for referring also to, to Professor Ayani, so something which came from society, um, which was conceived as a, a way, as a mean to, uh, at first to help, Russian refugees with their basic need, and secondly, to have like a way in which uh, debating, developing, debating also the, the, the conflict between the reds and the whites. So it was really a shadow government. There were many uh, meetings daily, daily meetings, which were followed by, for example, by uh, the uh, Parisian prefecture that is, come, that is known because of the archives. Uh, so they were spied by, by the police, of course. Um, but this, um, this attempt um, projected Russian liberals not only uh, into the present, but also into the future, because starting from the Parisian Peace Conference, there were many uh, unofficial organisms starting from the Society of Nations, which were based, on, 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 uh, based in Paris, and one of, I think, one of the best examples of that was that in June 1921, Friedrich Nansen, who was the first head for the um, for the um, for resolving the, the question of refugees, uh, decided to to convene um, uh, an organism in which members of the former uh, provisional government, so also Maklakov, but others member, other members of the uh, Russian Liberal um, Party, uh, participated, attended, and uh, the main achievement of that um, experiment was the Nansen passport, which was the uh, recognition of the stateless statelessness of refugees. So it was conceived for, for Russians, it, it, it became universal. So this was one of the main achievements of, um, of the Society of Nations, even if it, it was unofficial, but at is, at, uh, as it is commonly known, there were many <laughs> unofficial organizations and international law was basically uh, coming from different um, fields. Um, starting from that point, there was a kind of internal debate inside of the uh, Liberal Party, and in 1921, there was uh, a split. As was said by Professor Cigliano, Pavel Milyukov had um, a specific uh, conception of the uh, Liberal Party, which was made up 
of um, we, we have to see uh, a different semantic. The Liberal Party should be Siena Rodney, not Partinas, not Klasnas. So above all classes, above all parties, and representing all Russians. Uh, because of that semantic, the party was in a way, perhaps in, in, in during the Duma, sometimes uh, too con conciliating. It was, there was a kind of humiliating conciliarism between the leftists, so the radical uh, issues instances and the conservative instances. And the synthesis was, was found because of mobilizing reasons. So at first, because of the fight against the autocracy. Secondly, because of the war, so for the national bloc. And thirdly, because of the fight against Bolshevism. But after 1921, there was a complete defeat. So the right army, the volunteer army was completely defeated by uh, the Red Army. So there, there was no more mobilizing reason to, to act. So the new mobilizing reason was the international framework. And um, in particular, Vasily Maklakov had already started this kind of uh, reasonment because of the embassy. So he started uh, attending, for example, uh, meetings on uh, Albert Kahn, which was uh, um, an important um, defense of the international arbitration. But the international arbitration became the new mobilizing reason for liberals. And in a way, I think that um, the uh, progressive, so the um, leftist social, uh, leftist liberal um, wing of the party took over the conservative because of humanitarian law, because there were some um, exponents such as uh, Andre Mandelstam and Boris Mirkin Gutsevic who at first were unknown, but at that time they became really known. They were uh, international, they were lawyers, of course, they were juries, but they were also Jews. And this was important because they have uh, an idea of statehood, which was really different from the imperial territorial idea of Russian empire. So they were, ready to have um, uh, uh, an idea of the, the, the law, the rule of law from below rather than from the above. So it was, uh, the, there was a Durkheimian con conception, so a kind of socialist conception from, from the community, from, from, uh, from below, which was opposed to the, uh, to the idea of formalist uh, the, the Kelsenian idea of a uh, formalist law. And this was in a way uh, taking over uh, in comparison to uh, the uh, conservative idea. Um, one of the, um, one of, of the way in which it was, it was uh, made was that um, many Russian liberals uh, attended the uh, International Institution of Law. Uh, within the International Institution of Law, they had the possibility to debating also a regionalization of the society of a nation. So there were, uh, it was uh, debated uh, how to uh, overcome the war in, in uh, an international framework. And in, uh, within that, there was a, a complete um, different conception of the, of the law, which was the um, idea of the international legal consciousness. So all juries, Russian, European, all juries were called from the humanitarian need to uh, respond to the international legal consciousness. They had to face uh, people needs. So starting from the question of refugees, 
continuing with the um, problem of, of uh, the famine, the medical disease, and so on. So it was established the right of the feeble instead of the right of the state. So it was, it was a complete change of the point of view of seeing uh, legal uh, issues. And uh, in, uh, in, uh, in a way, it was a kind of mandatory change for, for juries. So as for, for example, for, for um, um, Vasily Maklakov, uh, even if he was uh, a heir of the legal uh, conception of law, so he was, he had um, an, an, an Hegelian idea of law. He, in a way, um, renounced to, to that idea to uh, safeguard the idea of at least saving, a, uh, an, um, um, safeguarding the idea of Russia, of liberal Russia abroad because of Internet, because international law was the way also to stop anarchy from, uh, from among states. So the uh, fight against different states. So um, I would like to, to conclude with the idea that um, in uh, uh, despite uh, the uh, political split in Russian liberal immigration, there, there was uh, a rebirth within the international framework. And as uh, Kistiakowski, which was stated by my professor Ayani, as he, he stated in Landmarks, uh, of all formal values, laws plays the most important, its main content, its freedom. And inner freedom is only possible if outer freedom exists. And the latter is best the best school for the former. Thank you. Dr. Gravina, thank you very much, much for your paper. Uh, your paper contextualizes the privileged relationship, relationship between France and Russia as a, a background for the subsequent immigration to Paris of some Russian liberals emphasizing the relationship between Russian and French diplomacy and the role of international law. Um, in conclusion, uh, the Constitutional Democratic Party's uh, division between a conservative dominant uh, tendency and uh, a minority progressive tendency formed a synthesis in the framework of international law. Thank you very much for <clears throat> paper and their colleagues, colleagues uh, thank you very much for all contributions. Uh, I suggest we take a 30 minutes break here. Okay, okay. we'll continue uh, in uh, thir 30 minutes. 30. 30. Yeah. Okay. Mezz'ora, 30 minuti? Sì, o forse lo vogliamo fare di meno. Di meno? Va bene, sì, va bene, va bene. Ok. Sì, lo spero. Marco, interrompo. Eh?